Hello, everyone. My name is Adrian. I'm from Guatemala. And um, we're here to talk about Kotlin bots. I would like to um, start from the very beginning. By the way, there's a link on the, on the slides. I'm going to uh, tweet uh, uh, later about it, and I'm going to share with the organizers. So relax. There's, uh, there's some code, actually a lot of code. Um, a ton of slides, but uh, let's not worry about it. Uh, it will be available for you to check it out later. So as I was saying, let's start from the beginning. That's me. A couple of years ago, about to experience a flow of electrons passing through my body for the first time. As it turns out, you get a tingling sensation when that happens. Um, my, my dad used to be um, uh, in a club of uh, radio amateurs, so since my entire life, there's been like uh, cables, radios, uh, electronics in my house. Although my father is a lawyer, he's been uh, like an empiric engineer for, for a while. And that context, uh, in some way, gave me permission to experiment and learn. And that's something that I would like to share with everyone here. And uh, it's something that it, it um, uh, has allowed me to experience new things. As I mentioned, I'm from Guatemala. It's a small country in Central America. And something that I noticed since uh, I was in uh, the university is that um, as it's a developing country, we not, don't have access to the same things as here or in other uh, parts of the world. So it's important to connect, and it's important to let uh, that context transform our uh, raw talent into skills. The thing is, when you become an expert, a lot of times, you don't consider new and exciting possibilities to do experimentation, mostly because um, we get this mindset that something might fail. But failure, it's not that bad when we have some control over it, when we embrace uncertainty. So I would like to uh, keep that mindset for this talk. There are um, robots, sorry about this, um, that are quite amazing, like this from Boston Dynamics. Um, they're even a, a little creepy, you can see on the, on the lower corner, the one jumping backwards. It's really amazing what they've been doing. And there are other robots that are not uh, that good. <laughs> anyway, a lot of us really like robots. Mostly it's because we can in some way identify with these robots and building Hardware used to be for people at universities studying PhDs, people with a strong background in electronics, but that has been changing for a while. And nowadays, it's basically for anyone. And especially in, uh, in this audience, we are all developers, software developers, so we already have um, basically everything that we need. So in this talk, I will show you some tools to use Kotlin to build robots. I've explained in, in past talks machine learning with tacos and Firebase with Lego bricks. So this time, I'm trying something new, and I'm explaining robots with hiking. I like to take things that I really love, and there are things that uh, in some way people can identify with. And especially here in California, hiking, it's uh, uh, pretty much accessible for, uh, for anyone. We don't need that many things in order to do a hike. And um, though there are several places that are really amazing, like uh, Yosemite, we don't need to go that far away to do a hike. Um, we might say that all that we need is a path in order to do the hike and get in touch with nature. In a similar way, in order to build a robot, all that we need is a platform, both a hardware and software platform. So in this case, I'm using Android things. So just in case you are not an Android developer, uh, stay relaxed. We are going to cover the basic of how to use Android things. But uh, I would like to focus on uh, the hardware part and how to build with it. I don't want to get into the details of doing Android. So um, regardless of that, even if you haven't done any Android development at all, it's not that complicated to start with Android things. So that's our hardware platform. 
And uh, because it's called Android Things, I'm going to uh, say things a lot of times. Eventually, it's going to become so awkward that uh, your brain is going to start ignoring the word things. So let's things all the things. And because we're here in KotlinConf, let's Kotlin all the things. OK, so our platform, as I was mentioning, we need software and hardware, will be the Raspberry Pi and the Pico Pi. The Pico Pi is the one on the um, left. Basically, they have the same pinout. It's not the same uh, single board computer, but um, for our uh, ends, let's say it's the same. So the thing with the Raspberry Pi is that uh, it doesn't have a, a port out of the box in order to do debugging. So it's a bit difficult to work with it. On the um, bright side, it's really cheap. So you can choose. There are other um, boards supported. I, I chose PicoPy mostly because I can do debugging using the same port that gives powers to the, to the board. Uh, it comes with a USB-C on the side. And it's quite convenient, um, especially when you are starting. In a nutshell, that is Android. All the stack of uh, application, framework, libraries, and everything that we have available on the system. And this is Android Things. It's almost the same with some uh, parts that uh, are not exactly useful for doing IoT, like content providers, thank God, and runtime permissions. Although we, have, we do have permissions, it's not in runtime that um, we gave them to the, um, to the app. So we have the same Android framework, some hardware libraries, and the Linux kernel managed by Google, and apps and drivers. I'm going to mention that in a couple of slides, managed by developers. Seems uh, quite simple to understand. As I was mentioning, we have the same SDK, the same IDE, uh, Google Play services, Firebase, Cloud Platform, and many other libraries like uh, Retrofit, Rx, Java, uh, all available for us. What we don't have is a Play Store, more than one app running at the same time, because this is a single purpose. And we have a couple of things, especially for IoT. This talk is focused on experimenting and getting started. Is if any of you already have some experience with hardware, um, might find a little bit boring the explanation that I'm, uh, I will be doing in a couple of slides. But keep in mind that Android thinks it's so flexible that it's also useful to build IoT products and get them to market. So we have uh, over-the-air updates, an IoT console, several interesting things in order to build a connected product quite fast. Um, that's me. Not that many years ago, actually a couple of days, I was in Iceland. And uh, for the first time, I did some glacier hiking. It was amazing. But uh, I needed a, a couple of specific things, like crampons, an ax, uh, a harness. Those specific things that we need sometimes to do the hiking are uh, the tools that we need to complete that activity. So in this case, in order to build robots, we also need some tools. And I would like to show some basic uh, things that will be useful for uh, our um, robot thing. First is the breadboard. This is a prototype team board. It's um, really useful mostly because we don't need to do soldering. I have a, a board here in the back of the robot. Eventually, we're going to see this working. So keep in mind that uh, I'm showing just a, a bit of things right now. And I have another one connected here with a couple of uh, components, like an LED and a button that I will show on the Demo. OK, so the breadboard, let's get back to the slide, got several connections in a way that's important to understand. Here, we have like in an horizontal way. You, uh, usually, this is used for uh, 5 volts and ground. And over here, in a vertical way, for the components. Um, I remember a, a couple of years ago, I attended a software conference that showed how to build robots with, um, using JavaScript with uh, several JavaScript libraries. And someone asked, can I get electrocuted using this? And uh, it's normal to have these uh, questions when it's the first time that we're working with uh, this type of hardware. As I mentioned, the tools are uh, connected directly to whatever activity we're doing. So in this case, there's not like an official documentation about the, the breadboard, but you can Google about the, all these components. And on the inside, it's built like this. 
with uh, those metal thingies connecting all the um, different holes where we can put components and we don't need to solder them. Also, we have the LED. It comes with uh, two terminals, the anode positive and the cathode negative. You can see that here is a small like uh, hammer-shaped terminal. Usually, this, uh, uh, this one is uh, a little bit longer than the other one, but keep in mind that someone can trim the terminals of the LED, so it's easier to notice the flat spot and the hammer-like uh, terminal. So this is a circuit. In case you haven't worked with hardware before, this is our hello world, lighting an LED. And all that we need is a battery and a uh, resistor. We need this in order for the LED to not um, blow up, not exactly as in terms that this is going to explode, but in terms that it's going to be burned. And uh, after that, we can use the same LED. All these components are quite cheap, so you can get, it, get them right away. And you can notice that here we have a circle, like the word circuit comes from that. Um, as a diagram, we can see it like this, the battery, the LED, and the resistor. But sometimes, also, we can see it like a line. So is it really a circle? Keep in mind that this uh, set of symbols, like five volts and ground, are common. And those are the two terminals of the battery. So although this is a line, it's like connected on those two sides. Besides having the right equipment and the tools, like the LED and the um, uh, breadboard, we also need to understand some rules. Um, this is a picture in New York City, if I'm OK with that. Let me see. Yeah. And it says, basically, danger, thin ice, keep off. We need to follow the rules when doing a hike in order to stay safe. This is another picture that I took in Iceland. It was interesting to me uh, to learn that they don't allow drones in several of their uh, like touristy places. Anyway, we need to know the rules and follow them to stay safe. In the case of the robots, there are a couple of uh, ways of measuring things. We're going to use electric potential, current, and resistance. And each one of these comes with a different unit, volt, ampere, and ohm. And the relation between these three can be modeled with some rules, or laws in this case. The basic one is Ohm's law. It's a relationship between current voltage and resistance. It's easy to remember with uh, this uh, triangle or uh, pyramid on the uh, lower side on the left. But we also have a Kirchhoff current and voltage law. Basically, all that the, this law states is that the algebraic sum is going to be equal from any given point, connected point on a circuit. So in this case, I2, that's a current, plus I3 is going to be equal to I1 plus I4 that are going the other way. And in the case of Kirchhoff's voltage law, we have a closed circuit, a mesh. And the voltage that we have here, it's going to be around the whole uh, connected circuit. And on each resistance, some voltage is going to fall. So here, we have voltage 1 plus voltage 2 plus voltage 3 equal to voltage 4. There are many other laws and electronic background that we need, but basically with this, we can start. So let's light an LED. It's our, our hello world on working with hardware. So we need to set up some hardware things. In this case, it's important to know the pinout. This is the pinout for the Pico Pi. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see the assignment of each one of the pins. We have uh, like uh, 5 volts or BCC, ground, a couple of other things like PWM, GPIO. I'm going to explain like the, these categories. And on the left-hand side, you can see the microcontroller or a single board computer, depending on, on the case. In, uh, here, it's a SBC. And highlighted are the pins and how they are assigned. So the circuit for the LED is this one. I took it from the official documentation from other things. Um, and it's, um, 
it's uh, done using a tool called Fritzing. It's open source, and uh, you can drag and drop the different uh, electronic components. It's uh, really useful when you are uh, trying to draw some uh, schematics. So we have uh, the LED, the resistance, and the connection to the um, uh, microcontroller. As I mentioned, the Pico Pi and the Raspberry Pi share the pinout, so that's why here's a Raspberry Pi, although I'm using the Pico Pi for the sample. So we connect the LED, and we have several options in order to work with the software side. The peripheral input and output come with all these different ways of handling it. The lower three, I squared C, SPI, UART, are for serial communication. I'm not going to cover those in this talk. We are going to cover GPIO and PWM. So in order to light the LED, we're using a uh, general purpose input output. It's the simplest mode, only one pin, two possible values, one or zero, high or low, uh, BCC or ground. There are many names, but it's the, the same thing that we are uh, just calling in a different way. And for the software, we are using Kotlin. Finally, after like one third of the talk, we're going to see some Kotlin code. First, we need Android things, so we add this on the um, uh, Gradle file, app level. We also configure the library on the manifest, and we need uh, an, a specific intent filter in order to launch this. Keep in mind that it will be the only application running because it's a uh, single purpose. On the activity, by the way, all this is on my GitHub, already published on, on, on the, um, uh, as a footnote, you can find the URL. On the activity, we're going to have a variable for the LED and also a job, because we're going to blink the LED. The idea here is that we are using coroutines. If by any chance you haven't heard of the coroutines yet, it's something really, really amazing that Kotlin provides as an experimental feature. And in a nutshell, it's like a lightweight thread. So, there's no context switch, and we have uh, some uh, way to write code that seems synchronous, but under the hood, all the heavy lifting is being done by the library, and it's actually asynchronous. So we use a peripheral manager service in order to open the, the pin and set the direction to out. Keep in mind it's input and output, so we say it's out initially low. Then we launch the core routine and uh, it will only execute a uh, suspend function. In this case, it's uh, LED blink. And the LED blink would only toggle the value, show a message on the log, and then call itself again. Keep in mind that as this is a core routine and we are suspending the function, the call to delay is non-blocking. So it's only suspending this part of the code, not everything as, as something like thread.sleep would have. So let's um, move to the code. I'm going to plug in the microcontroller. And first, I'm going to show you the code on Android Studio. Then we're going to see, working, see it working on the microcontroller. So um, uh, let's see. By the way, sorry about the flickering on the screen. We tried a couple of things, but I noticed that it came back. I don't know exactly when, but um, it's there. So let's see if the device is already there. OK, and let's run the code. On the activity, as I mentioned, here's the, the LED. I also, I have code for a button that we're going to see in a couple of slides. And after the initialization, we only have the launch of the coroutine. So if uh, we could zoom to the circuit, let's see if the light help us. And the LED would be blinking. Um, could you focus the camera on the circuit, please? There we go. Right here is the LED. Too many cables. 
Uh, it's a bit too bright. But there we go. We can see it. We can see it blinking. Woo! Our first circuit. <laughs> and although I'm like uh, doing all this wiring and explaining the code, the first time that you do this by yourself, it's amazing. You, if you haven't tried it, please do. It's like when you light your first LED, you feel like, I am Prometheus. I just stole the fire. And that, that feeling, it's something that I've seen so many time, times and allows you to keep creating. Um, that's the secret for the button. I'm going to explain a bit on the, on the theory, but I uh, don't want to uh, spend that much time on this. As you can see, there's a resistor and two connections, one to the uh, pin that will detect the, when the button is pressed, and one to ground besides the resistor that's connected to BCC. And this is because the input can be on, off, or open. When we have a state of open, that's a bad idea because it's on high impedance and we are not able to know exactly what's going on that pin. So instead of having this, when it's open, we're going to add a pull up, a connection to BCC. So when the, the switch is open, the button is not pressed, we have five volts, and when it's closed, we have zero volts or ground. It can also be done the other way around with ground and BCC switching spots, and that's a pull down. That's why we have these two um, connections. And again, we're using a GPIO, in this case, the direction is in, and we can also configure the edge, because this can be a positive edge trigger or negative edge trigger button. Here we're detecting the edge falling, and um, we have a callback. Basically, that's it. It's the same, it's uh, running uh, on the same project, so I'm going to show the log right here. And by the way, I don't have a servo plugged in, but the code is running. So you can see it's uh, running at the same time. The status is the, the LED, and the pulse duration is the, the um, uh, pulse that uh, the servo is getting. And when I click the button, it's a little loose, so let's hope it works. OK, that's plug. There we go. The button is pressed. So basically. This is the um, start in order to build some robots. I'm going to um, start going a bit faster on the pace because we are already doing um, the basic things. That's a um, movement sensor. I gave this talk uh, a week ago, tried uh, the movement sensor, and for some Unbeknown reason to me, it didn't work, so that's why I didn't plug it in today. Uh, maybe because it needs calibration. But basically, we need a GPIO pin, set the direction, if it's uh, activated when high or when low, and which trigger we're looking for. And then we, res we register a, a callback. With this, we can. Uh, easily build uh, an uh, intrusion detection system. We can also connect a camera to the board. I'm not showing the code during the talk, but it, it's on the slides at the very end. If you have worked with the Camera 2 API on Android, it's the same. And uh, we just need to grab the images and do something with them. So besides the camera code, there's also Firebase code. As I mentioned, it's easy to connect to cloud services. I chose Firebase mostly because uh, it's really easy to work with, uh, with that service, but you can uh, choose the one you prefer. As I mentioned before, we can also plug a servo. And this is a bit different, because instead of GPIO, we will be working with PWM. It's similar, but this is output only. And instead of being digital, one and zero, this is analog, so we can have a wide range of values. So that's why it's used for motors and for buzzers 
And for whatever we would like to use, that's uh, an actuator. That's, that means it's an output from the board and also needs some analog signal. Um, so instead of doing an open GPIO, we're doing an open PWM, but the structure is the same. And then we can configure the, fre the frequency, the duty cycle, and that seems uh, a little bit too much. So that's the initialization. And uh, in order to move it, what I'm changing here is the pools. So the pool might be increasing or decreasing. I don't want to get that much into detail, mostly because we're going to be using libraries in order to uh, uh, add a layer of ast abstraction for all this. Um, this is the, the function to move the servo. As you can see here, we have the duty cycle. We're uh, setting based on the pulse duration and again, delaying the suspend function. By the way, it's important to close the pin that you're using. Otherwise, if you execute the code uh, more than one time, it's going to show an exception that the pin is already open. Um, eventually, when doing our hike or building our robots, we're going to be able to um, uh, go places a little bit far away. This is a picture from the Yosemite Mist Trail. It was an amazing day with a rainbow, uh, the waterfall. So with the robots, we can use drivers. It's uh, the next step. So in order to work with sensors, GPS, or work with some input, we can use these user drivers. It's uh, similar to a library. And as you can see, the code is way more simpler. This is for a button, although it was already uh, simple. This is even more. And the behavior is the same. With the servo, it's uh, more noticeable that uh, we only configure it, uh, the angle, and if it's enabled or not. And then we can directly change or grab the angle. Instead of setting the duty cycle and knowing uh, which uh, range of uh, pull duration we need, we only set an angle between zero and uh, 180 degrees. And over on top of that, we can work with a peripheral driver library that's available online. And if you are just starting with hardware, I highly recommend getting this hat. It's called hat because uh, you can connect it on top of the microcontroller. And it provides several things like buttons, LEDs, a uh, seven segment display, a sensor, a buzzer, and connections on the, uh, on the side like this to plug like PWM, uh, I squared C, etc. So with the rainbow hat, we add another layer of abstraction. And in order to work with a sensor, it comes with a temperature sensor. It's great for experimenting, but if you are doing something like serious, I don't recommend working with this, mostly because the, the, the sensor is right here and really close to the CPU. So the measurement is not going to be that accurate. The sensor, the, the chip itself, it's really good. Just that it's just that on the hat, it's not working uh, as well as uh, if we can connect it on a different circuit. So if you have worked with a sensor on Android, it's basically the same. In this case, we are registering the listener for the uh, temperature sensor. And we use a driver for that. Basically, that's it. After that, we only need a couple of methods when the accuracy change or, or the sensor change. And we start getting these values. There are many drivers. It's not that difficult to write one on our own. Uh, this is the screenshot from the Android Things GitHub where you can find all the available drivers at the moment. OK, so as I mentioned, we're going forward. So let's build a simple vehicle. For the vehicle, we will need some wheels or any way of movement and some control. In order to move the vehicle, we can use either a DC motor or a servo motor. This is a DC motor plug in with an H bridge. The idea behind the H bridge is that uh, we're going to change the way the current is flowing in order to move the motor in a uh, different direction. So if you are able to light an LED, you are able to control this. It's basically the same code, only using two GPIOs. And um, we have a GPIO A and B. 
here we have a, a job in order to change the direction. And going forward, it's setting one GPIO to true, the other one to false. Backward, it's the other way around. Stop both to false. And with that, we have our wheels. So I'm going to execute the code for just one wheel that uh, we have here. And this is DC motor activity. Let's see. And it's unplugged, so I'm plugging it in. So you can see the wheel is moving, then it stops, then it will move the other way. This is the H bridge. Uh, you can get one from Amazon or from uh, any provider in China. It's really cheap. Here we can connect two motors. I would like to show you, I'm going to plug it again, otherwise it's going to keep running. I'm going to show you uh, a video about um, a small rover that I built. This is using four motors. It doesn't have any sound. I, I just want to, uh, for you to see that it's uh, easy to build something like that. And um, I'm controlling it with a, with a mobile app that uh, we will see in a couple of slides. So basically, we need a way to move forward, backward, uh, turn to the left, turn to the right, and we have our vehicle running. So uh, there's that. This is the, the configuration, as I mentioned, two GPIO pins. And for the control, the easiest way that I found uh, to build this is using the nearby connections API. And what we're going to do, it's uh, what's uh, here on the diagram. The um, Android Things board will advertise, and the mobile app will discover. Eventually, there will be a request and accept on both sides. And there will be a, a send and receive of a payload. The payload can be a stream, a file, or bytes. Bytes is the simplest way, in this case, to just send something to uh, move the vehicle forward, backward, or stop it. Okay, the Things app needs uh, play services. As I mentioned, it's available. We're using all these permissions in order for uh, the connection to work. It could be uh, Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, but we are not managing it. It's uh, on the API. And the access course location, it's a uh, dangerous permission. So um, I think this is working from uh, Android Studio 3.0 uh, forward. In case you're using a previous version, you need to reboot after loading these permissions. And as I mentioned, we need to start advertising. We need a strategy. That means this, this can be a star. We're using just a connection from one point to another. And eventually, when the connection is initiated, we accept. This is not uh, encrypted in any way. We are not validating anything, just accepting the connection and giving some uh, feedback on the log. When the connection, it's, uh, the, the status is OK, we stop advertising in order for only one client to be connected at a time. Eventually, when we receive the payload, we're going to parse uh, it byte. It, 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 those are bytes, but uh, it's a string. So with that in mind, we only do a, a when statement to check if it's null. Otherwise, we'll see if it's going forward, back, left, right, or stop. The mobile app, it's similar in terms of uh, the nearby API, the same permissions, in this case, Access code location is a runtime permission, so we do need to show the user a uh, dialog for uh, them to accept. And instead of doing advertising, we're doing discovery with the same strategy. And after we have an endpoint available, we connect to that endpoint. So let me show you this small Sumabot running. This is a kit uh, built for uh, Nodebots. The idea with Nodebots is um, using Node.js to control um, hardware. In this case, with uh, Kotlin bots, I think we can achieve the same with a different language. So we're going to see this moving in a couple of seconds, as long as my phone connects to it. So I'm going to keep talking while it's uh, connecting. When, when we're doing hardware demos, 
Live demos are always difficult, but when we're doing hardware demos, it's important to have a plan A, B, it's requesting connection, okay, there we go. And in case everything fi fails, a, a plan uh, maybe C, like juggling on the stage in order to keep the audience entertained. So I'm going to control it with my phone. As you can see, it goes forward, backward, it can turn. And what we're using here, it's a servo, but a specific servo. It's called a continuous rotation servo. Um, let's get back to the slides. Here you can see the, the kit. It's uh, an open source kit, as I mentioned, built for a Notebooks day. And it's easily 3D printed, or uh, if you have access to a laser cutter, the laser sheet is also available. Otherwise, you can buy uh, one of these kits. And although it's built for Arduino, it can hold without an issue the um, Pico Pi. So as I was saying, this is a continuous rotation servo. And the difference between a normal servo and this one is that uh, this continuously rotates. So it will go clockwise if we set the angle to 90, counterclockwise, no, sorry, uh, 180, counterclockwise if we set it to zero, and it will stop if we set it to 90. So this is all the code that we need to uh, build a servo wheel. And the configuration is needed, so we still need to set the uh, angle range, uh, set enable, and all of that. But basically, that's it. So with a couple of lines, we have the wheel, and a couple of more lines, and we have the vehicle. Because we only have these two wheels, left and right, the connection using the nearby API, and it will be work like forward, both wheels going forward, backward, both going backward, turning will be uh, stopping one wheel and keeping the other going forward, and that's it. As easy as that, we can build a small vehicle. I'm running out of time, so I would like to uh, start wrapping up things. This is a work in progress, and um, keep that in mind, because my main goal with this talk was getting people interested in doing hardware, regardless of their background. So I will really love to see Kotlin Bus to grow as a movement, to get more people building in different ways. At this moment, I'm using Android things, but with Kotlin native, we can uh, run it on the Raspberry Pi. Eventually, crossing fingers, it will run on Arduino, and it will eventually run on more hardware. I would like to show a couple of uh, projects that I'm working on. That's a robot called Auto. Uh, it works with four servos. It's a simple biped. Um, it might be a little hard to notice, but here the, the right foot is uh, like <laughs> broken. I try 3 printing that part like four times, and every time when I was putting the servo, it uh, ended up broken. So that's why Auto is not here. Um, quick note on this, it uses four servos. The board only have two PWMs, so in order to work with more servos, you need another hat. There is one available from Adafruit that provides, using the I2C, the protocol that I mentioned before that we didn't cover here, it provides 16 servos. Uh, this is the DC rover that I showed before. The thing with this rover is that this is a, a, like a formal chassis that you can get from uh, a Sparkphone or another provider. But moving a wheel, it's so easy that you don't need a, like a chassis uh, uh, like, uh, like that. You can build a junk bot using uh, an empty water bottle or uh, any other thing that will just allow you to connect two wheels. And these are a couple of uh, projects that I built using uh, Notebots that I'm looking forward to port to Kotlin bots. This is a simple tic-tac-toe using a LED matrix. These are called NeoPixel. It's a really cool implementation of LEDs, mostly because you can control it using only one pin uh, for data. And uh, there are RGB LEDs, so you can show any color. This is the um, project that I use in order to get into the uh, 
GDE program for Firebase. On uh, the left, I'm drawing here on a web page. Here is the Android emulator, and here it's a big uh, matrix built with several small matrices. And uh, the idea here is that you can draw on any of those apps, and it will also replicate here on the uh, matrix. So I'm looking forward to pour that with uh, Kotlin. And also, let's see, I have another video. Using the same material, the same matrices, this is a, a classic Tetris. What I'm trying to share here is that uh, you don't need access to a lot of different materials. Work with whatever you have available. And uh, you don't need to wait for uh, someone to like give you all the tools. Work with whatever you have today. A couple of uh, things with Android things. Displays are optional, keep that in mind. Uh, there are several ways of handling the UI, although you can connect uh, a display. The Raspberry Pi comes with an HDMI, and the Pico Pi comes with a port to connect a, a touch screen. There are several ways of handling the UI. It also uh, will raise some challenges, but that's where the fun is. And if at any point you want to turn this into a real IoT product instead of uh, just a robot for uh, having fun, and that's, that's called a sumo bot because you can get two of those to fight. It's really fun to do that. But anyway, this, this works with a, something called system on model architecture, so you can use the same chip without the breakout, because this is really expensive. It's like uh, $60, $60. Only the chip, it's, uh, the, it, the chip is more cheap, and you can build your own board and easily use the same code. So getting into production, it's not that difficult. And you can build cameras, point of sales, routers, uh, predictive services, or whatever you are looking forward to build. And there are many of these projects already published on uh, Hackster.io. Feel free to check those out. And especially, keep in mind that we only need a spark. And I'm hoping to light that spark today. And eventually, we'll have more Kotlin bus talks, more Kotlin bots uh, meetups, and uh, a lot of more people that currently are software developers taking into hardware and building some robots for their own personal robot army. Um, almost out of time, so I will only uh, like to say I'm really excited to be here, and I'm going to be around if you have any questions. Basically, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>